I get a B12 and B complex injection every two to four weeks. Now I'm not advocating that for everyone, but I want to explain in this video why the B vitamins are extremely important, especially when it comes to mitochondrial function and red blood cell formation. And also why, especially with things like B12, we might have issues getting a sufficient amount in, even if we take it in form of a supplement or we're getting it from our diet because the absorption in the digestive tract might be problematic. Now, uh, most US adults are actually consuming sufficient B vitamins from supplements and to a lesser extent from diet. Now, the nutrient quality of our processed foods, which is about 60% of what Americans eat on average, I suppose, is questionable at best. Now, taking a multivitamin daily will certainly give you sufficient amounts of B vitamins on paper. But this does not really work out in practice because oral vitamins have to get absorbed from the digestive tract in order to enter the bloodstream, right? And this absorption rate decreases with age. GI issues like inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, uh, ulcerative colitis, celiac disease, and so on, um, you know, they really can impair the absorption of nutrients and vitamins tremendously, actually. Dietary restrictions like a vegan diet, for example, can also affect, of course, the absorption or the availability of these uh, vitamins. Furthermore, oral multivitamin supplements will contain a synthetic form of vitamin B6 called pyridoxine. And this can actually cause a B6 deficiency under certain circumstances that I will explain in this video as well. Now, the B vitamins are important for many critical reactions in the human metabolism. And they're water-soluble vitamins, uh, so they're not stored in the body and must be replaced daily. Deficiencies of any B vitamin can adversely impact mitochondrial metabolism and energy production, as well as mitochondrial health. And I've talked about the importance of mitochondria for overall health in other videos. Prolonged B vitamin deficiencies can increase the risk of cardiovascular disease, cognitive dysfunction, dementia, osteoporosis, nerve damage, cancer, and autoimmune disorders. So it's really important that we get a sufficient amount of B vitamins in our diet or into our bloodstream, I should say. The B vitamins include thiamine, which is B1, riboflavin, B2, niacin is B3, pentothenic acid, B5, pyridoxine, or pyridoxal 5-phosphate, and that's B6. And I want to talk about that a bit later. So this, the synthetic form is pyridoxine, but that needs to be converted in the body into the pyridoxal 5-phosphate um, uh, form of B6. Uh, when we eat uh, things, you know, when we get our B B B6 from nutrition, it is already usually in this form, in the pyridoxal 5-phosphate form, which is much easier to uh, use because it's already active, right? So biotin B7, folate B9, and cobalamin, which is B12, right? So there are many enzymatic processes that support cellular health where these B vitamins are involved in. And this is uh, concerning muscle, organs, brain, and nervous system. So our whole body, most of the cells in our body are really uh, needing <laughs> certain amounts of these vitamins at any time. I'm going to start with vitamin B12, uh, even though that's the last one on the list, because that is one of the most important ones and where we see um, most of the deficiencies, at least in my clinic, right? And vitamin B12 or cobalamin is very abundantly present in, uh, you know, fish, meat, poultry, eggs, and dairy. And that's kind of a common theme through this. So you see already that, you know, if someone following a, a vegan diet or even vegetarian diet, they might have a harder time getting sufficient amounts of some of these vitamins. And most vegans are very smart and they know, look, I might not get sufficient amounts from my diet, so I might have to supplement this one, right? Now, um, oral B12 or cobalamin from food or supplements combines with intrinsic factor from the stomach and is then absorbed in the distal ileum in your intestine, right? Cobalamin, again, is required for red blood cell production, neurologic function, myelin synthesis. It's also a cofactor for DNA and RNA synthesis. So it's hugely important, right? Also has a role in uh, hormone, protein, and lipid synthesis. Digestive tract issues, older age, or medications like proton pump inhibitors, something that you take when you have um, acid reflux, right? Um, and that's actually very important to understand that, you know, when we are inhibiting the stomach acid a bit, there's also less absorption of this. It needs to get out of the food. It needs to bind with intrinsic factor. It needs to be absorbed at a certain part of our intestine. I would argue that vitamin B12 is one of the most difficult ones to really, really absorb, right? Uh, culture seed metformin to other medications that can slow the absorption process or hinder the absorption process. Now, when we don't get sufficient amounts in, or when any of these factors, old age or malabsorption are there and our B12 levels decline, we can get something called megaloblastic anemia and also neurologic disorders. Uh, 
Now, megaloblastic anemia, anemia, or more generally, a macrocytic anemia, is uh, essentially um, you know, a production of abnormally large red blood cells. The cells lack, lack their normal functionality, right? So they're not uh, working as well. And they look differently. They're much larger. When we think about red blood cells, what's their function? They transport oxygen, right? They pick up oxygen in the lungs and they bring it to the tissue, you know, through the capillary beds. And then they pick up CO2 and bring that back to the lungs. You know, that's one of the main functions of red blood cells. Now, when they are very large, first of all, they're going to have a hard time navigating through tight capillary beds. So we're not going to get it uh, or, uh, oxygen delivery and pickup of CO2 as much in tissue as we would get with healthy cells. But the other thing is even the functionality in doing these processes is impaired because of their uh, changes in the way that they're built, right? Because we have a shortage of B12. So B12 massively changes the functionality and look of these uh, cells, right? So um, megalocytic or macrocytic anemia is just one of these manifestations. Um, symptoms of, of these anemias will include what are some experience when they have this weak muscles, nausea, numbness, or tingling in the hands and feet, a decrease in appetite, weight loss, and low energy. I know this sounds very general. People are saying, oh, I have all of those. Uh, yes, but this is pretty profound. And um, people that have a change in this, they would usually notice this, right? And especially when it comes to tingling in the hands and feet. I mean, that is a really a neurologic issue that you should always uh find out what that is. And it could be something as simple as a B12 or a B6 deficiency that can cause this sort of uh, tingling or, you know, can also be uh, uh, something that we sometimes uh, uh, term differently, where it's a, a neuropathy, where it's like a numbness kind of, right? So it's important to understand if you have any of those symptoms, get that checked and one a B12 level should always be checked. It can also cause mood disorders, by the way. And B12 is actually very helpful for stable mood. So when someone is depressed, we should always check, hey, does this person have sufficient vitamin B12 in their, in, in their system? And it's a very easy blood test, right? Okay, so vitamin B1, thiamine, is actually very abundant in nutritional yeast, uh, cereal, which I don't recommend anybody eats, but it's in there, uh, bread, and also in dairy to some extent, not a lot. So thiamine or B1 has a critical role in energy metabolism and cellular function. It's essential for the metabolism of pyruvate, which is part of mitochondrial energy production. You might remember this from the uh, citric acid cycle. And it helps maintain a healthy nerve function, right? Uh, low thiamine levels can affect mitochondrial activity and metabolism. So again, always we come back to mitochondrial function. All the B vitamins have a role here and actually have a massive role here. And that's why I think they're so important. Because again, I keep talking about mitochondrial health. Mitochondrial health is uh, overall health of your body, right? And it prevents diseases. So we really got to pay attention to this, I think, right? And um, so you will see um, severe deficiencies can even cause cell death. And this is especially true for neurons unfortunately, because they are uh, very high in the energy demand. And when we don't have sufficient B uh, uh, vitamin levels, especially in this case, your thiamine levels, the neurons may be damaged and some of them might actually die. So this is a very, very uh, concerning issue, of course, right? Now, um, thiamine can also serve as a free radical scavenger, also very important when we think about that free radicals can damage, and they can certainly damage uh, DNA and RNA. Low thiamine symptoms, what do we experience when we have very low thiamine? There could be uh, sensory, loss of sensory nerve activity in the extremities. Again, that's something that uh, you know is a, a bit different than in a B12 and B6 deficiency, but there could be sensory nerve uh, uh, malfunctions there. Heart failure, often with swelling in the hands and feet, chest pain, vertigo, double vision, memory loss. So all these things, of course, are very concerning. Memory loss, when we think about the neurologic impact I just mentioned, so that kind of makes sense. Vitamin B2, riboflavin, we find this also in uh, meat, dairy, and eggs. It's very abundant there as well, of course. Uh, needed to synthesize niacin, folic acid, and B6. So we actually need B2 to synthesize niacin, folic acid, and B6 we, to synthesize other B vitamins, right? And all heme products, heme from hemoglobin. So again, important for red blood cell production and functionality. Riboflavin is also needed for carbohydrate, protein, and fat metabolism. Um, it has an antioxidant effect, and it's very important to cellular respiration and a properly functioning immune system. Now, riboflavin deficiencies. What do we experience when we don't have enough riboflavin? Cracks and sores around the corners of the mouth, a swollen tongue or throat, fatigue, slowed growth in children and digestive problems are hallmark symptoms of a deficiency here, right? Then we get to vitamin B3, which is a niacin. Very rich, again, in meat, then brown rice, nuts, seeds, legumes, and bananas. So a bunch of different things that have niacin, really. We need niacin <clears throat> for DNA repair and cholesterol synthesis. 
if the, your lower niacin, and this is a very abbreviated, of course, uh, discussion of this, um, in severe cases, you get something called pellagra, which is a, you get a rash and sun exposed skin, redness of the tongue, digestive problems and memory problems. So again, also very important uh, vitamin, of course. And again, all of those very important for mitochondrial function, right? Um, then we have pantothenic acid, which is vitamin B5, which is found meat in meat, seafood, eggs, dairy, vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds. So in the variety of foods, really. Uh, pantothenic acid <clears throat> is essential in the synthesis of red blood cells as well. So again, many of these cells are involved in red blood cell synthesis and functionality. It's involved in sex and stress hormone production, coenzyme A, cholesterol, fatty acid, and acetylcholine. It's also important for a healthy digestive tract, and that's actually very important about the vitamin B5. So lack of vitamin B5 can cause digestive issues a bit more than the other B vitamins, actually. So uh, symptoms of low pant uh, um, pantothenic acid uh, maybe fatigue, depression, irritability, vomiting, upper respiratory infections, and so on. Now, vitamin B6, and that's a very important one. I mentioned earlier, there's two forms of this. We have pyridoxin or pyridoxal 5-phosphate, which is the active form, the form we would get usually from foods, right? Um, <clears throat> now, the active form, uh, the pyridoxal 5-phosphate, um, is a coenzyme that supports numerous enzymes in performing various functions, including the maintenance of normal levels of homocysteine, absorption of vitamin B, formation of red blood cells, supporting our immune system and brain health as well, and the breakdown of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. So pyridoxine, as I mentioned earlier, is synthetically produced, and that's really what you find in most uh, supplements, but also in the um, injectable form. I mentioned earlier that I get a B12 and B complex shot every two to four weeks. And in the B complex, they use pyridoxine, which is certainly not the preferred form of B6. However, it has a much longer shelf life. And, you know, when you think of these different vitamins that they put in this solution, they preserve it, it lasts a lot longer. Also, again, pyridoxine can be converted in the liver to the active form, right? It does require sufficient amounts of zinc, but in a healthy person, the conversion usually is actually pretty good. And the amount in the injectable is actually very, very small. So they don't put a lot in there. It's at the order of about uh, two milligrams per one cc. And on, in general, when you get an injection, you use about half a cc. There's only really one milligram of pyridoxin in there. Now, you do bypass the digestive tract though when you get, a, when you get an intramuscular injection. So the uh, disadvantage of the shot is in this case, because it needs to be activated in the liver, it doesn't go right to the liver. So the pyridoxine actually then first gets right into the bloodstream and then from the bloodstream ultimately to the liver, but it doesn't have this first pass liver. Um, again, with a small amount, I'm not so concerned about this. I'm more concerned if people take pyridoxine in large amounts daily with their supplements and there we see issues. So the pyridoxine, if you consume in larger quantities can be problematic, because if it's not converted in the liver to pyridoxal 5-phosphate or P5P, uh, then you might have uh, too much of this present and it might sort of, at least one theory is, clog up the receptors of the active form of um, B6, rendering this receptor not uh, able to then absorb or, or, or take in the active B6 and it doesn't, it doesn't work. So basically think of a door the uh, pyridoxine is a key that will fit into the lock, but it doesn't turn the lock. But as long as that key is in there, I can't put the correct key in and open the door, right? That's the problem with it. That's one thought. I'm not so sure because this is a bit theoretical right now. Again, if you take pyridoxine in, in, in smaller amounts, even a daily supplement, it usually gets converted and we don't have any issues with it. But there have been cases certainly of a B6 deficiency because we are flooding the body with pyridoxine. We don't convert all and it kind of clogs up the system if you want, right? That could be one of these uh, problems here. So when you get a deficiency, which can be either by not taking in enough active uh, B6 or too much pyridoxine, then you can get a rash, dermatitis, peripheral neuropathy. Um, you can get both either uh, low or, or, or high pyridoxine levels, low energy, uh, weak immune system, and you know other manifestations like that have to do with energy metabolism really all right so anyway so here's the point of this again i think the importance is that we get most of our uh, b6 in its active form right uh, and less of it in the pyridoxine form so when you look at your vitamin supplement if it, it usually will say pyridoxin or pyridoxin hcl 
as long as that's fairly low on on the order of you know somewhere under under 10 milligrams i would say daily it should be okay if you take too much of that in on the order of 40 or 50 milligrams a day that, that could be an issue then you're going to have actually a real potential of getting a b6 deficiency by taking in b6 which is kind of a weird thing to say but that's how that works okay Biotin, a vitamin B7, is very abundant in meat, organ meat, eggs, fish, nuts, seeds, as well as in sweet potatoes. It's needed in gene regulation, cell signaling, and replication. It's very important in the health of skin, hair, and nails, and you might have heard about that. A lot of supplements that advertise this is great for your skin and hair will have biotin in it, right? Also important for the liver and the eyes, as well as the nervous system. Catalyzes the metabolism of fatty acids, glucose, and amino acids. If you're low on biotin, if you have a deficiency in biotin, um, then you might have issues with like, you know, hair loss rash around the eyes, nose and mouth. So the skin uh, can get rashes in, in the face, seizures, skin infections, brittle nails, lethargy and neurologic issues. So biotin, very important, really for skin and hair, we can think of and the nervous system. Then uh, folate is vitamin B9, uh, found actually this one, not in meats so much, but more in like broccoli, leafy, green vegetables, beans, peas, and of course in cereals. Cereals are rich with folate, a folic acid, right? It is crucial for nucleic acid synthesis. So very important nucleic acid synthesis. Think of your DNA and RNA and red blood cell production. So this is a very, very important vitamin, of course. Now folate deficiency can lead to megaloblastic anemia as well. Remember we talked about this with vitamin B12. Both of those deficiencies of either one of those can cause a megaloblastic anemia characterized by large erythrocytes or red blood cells with abnormal nuclei. So when someone has a macrocytic or megaloblastic anemia, we have to find out is it a B12 deficiency or a folate deficiency? It could be either one of those, right? Um, common symptoms of folate deficiency are weakness, fatigue, poor concentration, irritability, headaches, mouth sores, neurologic issues, and changes in skin, hair, and fingernails. Low folate levels during pregnancy, and this is actually very important when you think of prenatal vitamins, prenatal vitamins will have a very high amount of folate. And even though most vitamins, they're going to go with the RDA, which is sort of laughable, but they go with, uh, a much exceeded RDA because they know that folic acid is very important for the healthy development of the nervous system of the developing baby, right? Um, so lacking the right amount of folate during pregnancy can uh, cause uh, fetal neural tube defects, congenital heart defects, and low birth weight, as well as preterm labor and delayed fetal growth. So for the developing baby, so if someone's pregnant, always tell them, you know, make sure you take your prenatal vitamins. They don't have to take other vitamins. I never recommend to give them vitamin injections. Any woman that's pregnant, you know, should only take prenatal vitamins and listen to their OBGYN. Uh, we don't know the effect of higher doses of vitamins on uh, a developing baby. Um, but for folic acid, we know that uh, deficiencies have occurred and it, it's good to supplement at a bit higher level there. And that's why when you look at any prenatal formula, you, you look at uh, uh, folic acid, it will be very high in there, right? But that's essentially um, the importance here of all these B vitamins. Again, when we think about mitochondrial function, overall health, these are all very important. The absorption of vitamin uh, B12 to me is the most uh, important one. And again, as I outlined earlier, it goes through many, many different mechanisms in the digestive tract to really get in. And there can be problems in different stages. And that's why deficiencies are very common there or most common with vitamin B12. I always recommend if you, um, you know, able to do so and, and, and you're healthy and you're, you know, not, not pregnant, of course, get a vitamin B12 shot once in a while. I think that's a good thing to do. Always talk to your doctor first, of course. Vitamin B complex, again, you don't always have to. I mean, I do it because I'm at the source, but also because I'm sometimes questioning my nutritional choices or, you know, at this stage, I'm over 50. How good is my digestive tract in absorbing those? Because, you know, they still got to get into the digestive tract if I take them in as oral supplements. So when I do a B12 shot already, I hate needles. Uh, we always prepare every shot in front of the client. And that's one thing that our clinic does. And also we freeze the area so it's really painless. Um, and, and therefore, since I'm at the source, I'm doing this B12, B complex. I think it's a good thing uh, personally for me. Again, whether it's something that you should do, talk with your doctor about it. But keep in mind, again, the absorption of some of these are not, is not good. Our nutrition is so-so, especially with processed foods. So if you buy vitamin supplements, you know, multivitamins, I would always look at the bottle, uh, what type of B6 it contains. 
Most likely it will be pyridoxine, but you can find uh, supplements also that have pyridoxal 5-phosphate or P5P, which is the active and preferred form, right? And then I would definitely go for that. You don't want to take too much of pyridoxine. Small amounts are fine. And again, they do get converted. Make sure you have enough zinc. If you take a multivitamin, multimineral, they usually have some in there. Um, in this cold and viral season, many people like to take a zinc supplement. Zinc, again, is something that you have to take daily. You don't store it. Um, I take a, personally do take a supplement. Talk to your primary care doctor if you should take one or not, of course. But I take 25 milligrams of zinc as well. And that certainly does help with the um, conversion of pyridoxine to the active form, the pyridoxal 5-phosphate.